the aside is this. The, the Tannehills are true to their Randian heritage, at least in this way. They treat government as the senior partner in the government business relationship. They act as if, to the extent that there is government business collusion, it's been brought about by oppressive governments beating up on poor old bosses who would be much happier if they could operate in the free market. I think that's just hooey. The Tannehills talk about a range of regulations imposed by government on business, but I think they are just oblivious to the degree to which these regulations were often sought by business and clearly benefit big business. It's not the case that most regulations were imposed without uh, any uh, support from business at all, uh, were simply rammed down the throat of businesses. What we find if we read the relevant history is that in fact in many cases some businesses very much profited from these regulations and wanted them. If you're bored and you want to pursue this, I direct you to a couple of the classic uh, texts in this area. Uh, Gabriel Kalko's work, uh, The Triumph of Conservatism. Kalko, a new left historian uh, who's been very popular among libertarians, uh, enthusiastically rejects being considered a libertarian historian himself, but uh, he's been very popular here because he said, look, big business claimed that it was opposed to this or that regulation, but we can repeatedly identify cases in which the, the progressive era regulations that uh, shaped the modern business government relationship turn out to have been brought about uh, at the instigation of big business. Similarly, in Butler Schaefer's uh, great book, In Restraint of Trade, which picks up uh, historically where Calco leaves off, uh, Schaefer talks about the ways in which businesses wanted cartels and couldn't get them in the market. And actively sought government support for cartelization so they could keep their prices high. The Tannehills just aren't, I think, focusing appropriately on the extent to which big business was a player here. They also seem oblivious, I think, to the degree to which government actors are representatives of the power elite and hold office because of the support of the power elite. Now, this is a bit complicated, right? I mean, there are some folks in government who are there because they are existing members of the power elite. Then you've got folks who come into office, let's say from uh, uh, middle class or poor backgrounds, who are co-opted in the course of running or in the course of governing uh, by the power elite. Now, then you've got people who are not perhaps co-opted by existing elites, but use political power to become members of the power elite. So I'm not suggesting that it's always the case that uh, the wealthy and well-connected uh, begin by controlling every politician. Some politicians use political influence to become wealthy and well-connected. Uh, what I am suggesting is that there's an intimate relationship between the two, and the Tannehills are just wrong if they want to act as if somehow it is a big business that is the victim of political manipulation. Uh, the Tannehills talk about the development of a fascistic business government partnership as taking place during the past hundred years. Uh, th this seems to me quite short-sighted as well. I mean, name a time when economic elites haven't used the state to enrich themselves and haven't seen the state as, in some sense, this is of course the Marx Engels phrase, their executive committee, okay? the state has consistently served as the executive committee of the ruling class. I, I challenge you to find a, uh, an extended period, uh, an extended geographic area uh, where this hasn't taken place. Now, when we talk about the power elite, and if you, if you want to pursue power elite analysis in sociology and history, uh, the most influential figures here undoubtedly have been C. Wright Mills, uh, who wrote a book called The Power Elite, and uh, more recently, G. William Domhoff, who's written a number of books about, uh, about this. Um, now, the power elite is not entirely unified. It's not as if these are folks who all get together at Skull and Bones uh, on the Yale campus and have meetings and make decisions. Uh, it's factionalized. Um, the great Carl Oglesby, sometime leader of Students for a Democratic Society in the 60s, uh, wrote a book with the title something like The Yankee and Cowboy Wars, in which he talked about geographic divisions uh, between uh, the Southwest and the Northeast as a primary loci of disputes within the power elite. Uh, they're overlapping sectors and, uh, you know, obviously there are some politicians who really are outsiders. I'm not suggesting that any and all politicians are captives of the power elite. Uh, so we might think about people like Ron Paul or Dennis Kucinich or Bernie Sanders. Uh, 
who in varying degrees and with some pretty disappointing exceptions uh, are outsiders who don't seem in general simply to be pressing the agenda of the power elite. But as a general rule, here's the point, as a general rule, the state and big business are partners, the state and the wealthy and well-connected are partners, both embody, both big business and the state embody and reflect the influence of the power elite. It is just false and naive to say that the alliance between big business and government has been forced by government or to claim, I, I, this is just, just floors me, to claim that left to their own devices, business people are anti-imperialist and anti-coercive. You know, Adam Smith, uh, famous as the, uh, you know, the founder in some sense of modern economics, Adam Smith said, and I'm paraphrasing, but it's never the case that a group of business people get together without their planning to shaft the public in some way. Uh, Smith was not a proponent of statism, obviously. He was an anti-mercantilist who valued markets. But state, Smith recognized that business people were not a uh, uh, benevolent trade-oriented group. Now, if business is seen as a, as a praxeological category, a category of action rather than an, an empirical tag for particular institutions in history, if business is a praxeological category, so if we're talking about the interests of firms just as firms, maybe this is so, but real flesh and blood business people are consistently pleased to use the state's coercive force to achieve their ends. There's just no, no question about this. Now, this isn't true of all of them, of course. Uh, there are lots of ordinary people involved in business activities who are principled, who are fair, who are compassionate people who are not interested in using force to shaft others. But people who want wealth and power are often quite willing to use force to obtain it. And the fact is that just as in political environments, so in corporate ones, the people who rise to the top are people very often who are ambitious and power hungry. They are not uh, a random sample of the population. The Tannehills seem to accept uh, the view of their mentor, Rand, that big business, this is uh, perhaps the most laughable thing that Rand ever said, uh, big business is a persecuted minority. Uh, this view is just, I think, absurdly blind to reality. Now, recognizing the silliness of what they say about big business certainly doesn't change the fact that the Tannehills are right that the abolition of government would affect the abolition of war in the sense in which we know it today. I don't think they're right that all big business people are enthusiastic fans of peace. Uh, certainly some are, and that's great, uh, but some are not. But certainly without the state apparatus to engage in war and to be captured by big business types, uh, war, I think, would uh, cease to be a feature of reality in the same way it is today. The state benefits from war. Right? Randolph Bourne famously said, war is the health of the state. And the state's ability to tax, to create money deceptively, to subsidize and to conscript, uh, certainly en enables it to engage in a kind of violence in which no group of freely cooperating people would ever want to become involved. This war consolidates the state's power. I mean, if you look at what's happened uh, during the past decade in the United States, uh, attacks on civil liberties, uh, denials of due process, the crazy things that have issued uh, on these fronts from both the Bush administration and the Obama administration would never have happened without war uh, on, the, on the agenda. I think it is not at all surprising that uh, what we've seen in the past decade has been uh, the uh, enthusiastic rush to war as a pretext for increased state power.